first of all, that rental properties are having a hard time cash flowing. Uh, you know, not they're, they're Jay, your market locally, the, the rents haven't gone down, but nationally, the rents have definitely gone down. And there's good national data that charts that show this. OK, mm -hmm. what has not gone down is expenses mm. and that compression that is pushing, you know, expenses going up and rents going down. That compression is affecting rental houses. So I have a lot of people right now transitioning, wanting to do something else with their money other than manage rentals that are a headache. And now there's now all of a sudden they're not cash flowing the way they were. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now, here's your host, Jay Connor. My guest today on Raising Private Money actually started all the way back in 1980. He's been helping buyers and sellers and realtors actually close more deals with what he calls creative financing. And that was even during the most challenging markets back then. Well, in addition to that, my good friend, mastermind member, he's personally closed around 50,000, can you believe, no deals. And his unique industry vantage point has allowed him to review close to a half a million notes. Do you think my guest knows something about the note business? We're also going to start out this show talking about private money and how it relates in today's market. Well, his expertise is trusted by some of the largest realtor networks in the country, top real estate investors, plus the mom and pop investor operators. His innovative ideas and strategies have revolutionized literally the note industry. He's the founder of what's called Note School. And at Note School, that's where he's helped thousands of investors scale up their businesses, become what he calls deal architects, build long-term wealth, and think like an entrepreneur. He's the president of Colonial Funding Group, which acquires and trades real estate secured notes. In just a moment, you're going to meet my dear friend, fellow mastermind member, and brilliant strategist, Eddie Speed. Welcome to Raising Private Money, Eddie. I was captivated by your commercial. That's awesome. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Eddie. And I tell you what, when you've got someone like yourself to introduce, it's very easy to be captivating. I'm so glad you're taking some time out of your very busy schedule to join me here on the show. Talk about what's going in the real estate investing market right now. What you see to be is the biggest uh, opportunities and advantages for realtors, tired landlords, real estate investors, and all the above. First, this is raising private money, Eddie. So let's start with that subject for a moment. Um, you've raised millions and millions of private money yourself. Go all the way back to the beginning. Now, of course, you've been investing in real estate for over 40 years. And there probably, if you're like myself, there probably was a trigger or a pivoting moment in your real estate investing career that you said, you know what? I need to go raise some money myself and not rely on the banks and not rely on other people's rules and put my own rules in place and go raise my own money. What was it that happened that caused you to start raising money? 1986. 1986, we, I started in 1980 in the business. 1986, every bank and savings and loan in Texas and the Southwest was going broke. Mm. We were selling loans to institutional investors like consumer finance companies and, and some savings banks. And, um, and they basically, they all hit the pause button and they checked out of the business. And I went and probably... I don't know. Within three or four months, Jay, I went from institutional money to like 90 percent without institutional money. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how did you start doing that? And the reason I ask this question is we've got thousands of listeners to this particular episode. And 
a lot of them have in their mind and are experiencing, you know, they're thinking to themselves, I've never raised private money in my lens. You're going to talk about in a moment about what's going in the market today and, yeah. and how that relates to private money. But you know, we got thousands of people listening that have never raised private money. Maybe they've never done a deal. Maybe they've done a bunch of deals and they've relied on, they've relied on institutional, uh, you know, lenders, hard money lenders, you know, banks, et cetera. Um, what's your advice to them on how in the world do you make that transition and how do you start? I think you got to know who your avatar is. You have to know who your customer is. If you're raising private money, you know, broken, desperate people aren't your cap aren't your capital source. If 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 you're raising passive private money, you got to go find somebody that's not a deal maker but has investable capital. If they already have all the deal flow they need, they don't need us, Jay. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have all the deal flow they need, and they're looking to get their money deployed, and there there there's some reason market reasons why that's definitely an issue today. Then, then you got to have people. I, I, I would say to you that, in my view, over a long period of time, probably ninety percent of the people that that I've raised money from have had a play in real estate and found out it was too much trouble. Mm -hmm. In other words, your your passive private lender, what I hear you saying, likes real estate, likes to be in real estate. But they just don't want the hassle of finding deals, negotiating deals, overseeing deals, doing the talk and do the negotiating and pretty much just want to sit back and, you know, watch their accounts grow, right? Passive investor, you know, I call it the bunny rabbit and the wolf, right? The wolf. Now, I've, known, I've known you for many years, but I've never heard about the bunny rabbit and okay, the wolf. Well, you, you and I are wolves, right? Yeah. We, 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 we want more yield. And but we're willing to go do more, right? Mm -hmm. A wolf will go hunt what he wants. Mm -hmm. A rabbit, well, he's a lot more passive than that, and he wants he's satisfied with a lesser return, but he doesn't want to go do he doesn't want to go manage things. And so that's really a key in private money that I've noticed is you've got to define who your customer is. First of all, they have to have money. Mm -hmm. Don't chase people that don't have money trying to get them to give you private capital because they don't have any dough, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly, and there's a lot of people with money today. We're not we're, we're sitting on a lot of cash as a country. Secondly, then define define it how it is you solve their problem and be clear with them how you solve their problem. One of my favorite ways to start a conversation with a potential private lender, and of course, I always say don't rule out anybody. Some of them people you think that are loaded are looking loaded and, you know, they're really not. And some people might be the opposite, but you got a pretty good feel. I tell you, my favorite place to start talking with private, potential private lenders. By the way, I got 47 private lenders right now funding our deals and not one of them had ever heard of private money or self-directed IRAs. And I love to start uh, conversations with questions questions that are actually going to lead to asking them what's important to them what are you looking you know to get out of your investments and one of my favorite conversation starters are what i call did you know questions i'll be talking to somebody at smithfield's fried chicken and barbecue and or down at starbucks having a cup of coffee and i'll just you know drop in the conversation one of my favorite questions which is did you know there's a way people can actually earn unlimited money tax free per year? And of course, they don't have no idea the answer to that question. And then, of course, that leads to a conversation about self-directed IRAs. Have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? And so then we'll start a conversation about how people can actually take a Roth IRA, invest it passively and et cetera. So, Eddie, when you're raising money, when you are, you know, talking to people about, what you can do for them. How do you like to start conversations and where do you go find these people? I find them at church where, where we've got a lot of trust, you know? Yeah. No, you I, I agree with that. Um, I, I like, I poke at the landlords pretty hard. You know, I, I tell people that a lot of people that, that end up, that, that we're able to help start out as a landlord and find, and then kind of wake up one day and some of them find out, you know, you're not too accusative, but you, you, they wake up and they say, man, this is, 
it's a lot more work than I bargained for. And I thought I was going to get more cash flow than I was going to get. And then I was like, well, you know, we, we, we show them how to be the bank and mm -hmm. just boom. That's a drop the mic thing, right? Just you, you don't need to chase them at that point. They're going to chase you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's been my experience. You know, I have observed that desperation has got a smell to it. And if someone's looking to raise money for deals, of course, I've also experienced the worst time and most dangerous time to be trying to raise money for your real estate deals is when you need it <laughs> for a deal, right? And so we separate the conversations of here's how our program works, how you here's how you can get high rates of return safely and securely without even talking about deals. Because first of all, they got they got to know that they are actually you know, interested in doing this kind of business and program. And then we'll come back along with a deal after we, you know, after they're saying, yeah, I like that. Well, I think one thing's about knowing something about the business. You and I believe in that because we both have training, right? It's tell them a story. You know, you're not, you're not telling them a lie. They you may tell a story about my customer, Jay, or your customer, because they may not have a customer yet, but it's okay. Just tell them a story about a customer and what they liked about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I've heard this all the time, but very few people unpack it. I'll hear the advice all the time. Just tell people what you're doing. OK, yes. Tell people what you're doing. But how do you implement that strategy of just telling people what you're doing? Well, you know, there's this thing called Facebook and this thing called Instagram. And you, I mean, if you're doing deals, you got to be doing deals to have a story, right? Yeah. But if you're doing deals, all you got to simply do is just post on your social media. Here's a deal I'm doing. And you can just sort of drop a hint if you've ever had any private lenders. And by the way, my investors in this deal are absolutely loving it with the insane return they're getting. You didn't ask for money. You didn't go out there and say, hey, I need money. All you're doing is sharing what you're doing. Now, let's bring all the all this to today, Eddie, where, where do you see private money and its relevance in today's market with what's going on? Well, Jay, I'm going to warn you, somebody's fixing to get their feelings hurt. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, look, that never surprised me about you. <laughs> because I'm, I'm going to call, 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 call it straight up what it is. And you and I are in a mastermind where I saw somebody got their feelings hurt a week or two ago. Because they were ha 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 and all that in the bag of chips and then whatever and stuff. And another friend of ours put the hand on them and kind of pushed them down and said, well, if you just wait for the fat woman to sing, you may find out that things ain't exactly what they said. A well-read investor, a well-read investor knows two things right now. First of all, that rental properties are having a hard time cash flowing. And, you know, not they're, they're Jay, your market locally the, the rents haven't gone down, but nationally, the rents have definitely gone down. And there's good national data that charts that show this. OK, mm -hmm. what has not gone down is expenses mm. and that compression that is pushing, you know, expenses going up and rents going down. That compression is affecting rental houses. So I have a lot of people right now transitioning, wanting to do something else with their money other than manage rentals that are a headache. And now there's now all of a sudden they're not cash flowing the way they were. The second problem is, and this is where somebody's going to get their feelings hurt, I'll assure you. <laughs> and that is our friends in the multifamily space. Because let me just tell you something. It ain't headed to a good spot. Mm -hmm. And um, and you don't, you don't need to believe Eddie Speed. You can go do your own Google research. If you spent two hours researching information, by the way, I... I'll give you some of that if you want it or where to look. But uh, if you if you sent, spent two hours looking into it, you would be like, oh, my God. Are you telling me, Eddie, that loan production for multifamily is down over 60 percent? Since when? That first of the year. Wow. That's remarkable. Well, let me tell you something. All you got to do is go read the TREP report. 
TREPP, T-R-E-P-P. It is the gold standard for commercial real estate. And all you got to do is read some of the stuff that they generate. This is what every hedge fund, every mortgage banker that's in commercial, like the, the, the guys that play in the space that know what they're doing, TREPP is a very trusted thing. And when you read it, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, their loan production is down 60% since the first year. Uh, two of the biggest commercial lenders have exited the space in the last month, Blackstone and, and KPR, KKR. And uh, then uh, uh, Starwood has not far behind them, essentially saying that they're, they've heavily paused what they're doing. So understand, why would all uh, banks have doubled their down payment? Now, let me ask you a question. If there's no problems, why did all this happen? Mm -hmm. So understand, what does this mean if you're raising private money? Oh, if you're raising private money, people are having to go find alternatives. They're having to find alternatives to more traditional real estate uh, investments like rent houses, like, like syndications. Okay, well, that's good news for us, Jay. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to what's happening with Fannie Mae down, uh, the, the other institutional lenders, you know, way down, I mean, commercial 60%. What is a real estate investor entrepreneur to do with that information? What's the warning and, and where's the pivot? Well, um, I, I, I I believe you and I hang out with a circle of people and I love them to death and they're really good, ethical, sweet people. They just, their risk management skills are not super high. Like I've survived in this market almost 45 years and I had to develop some risk management skills. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to read, you got to read, you got to be able to read the storm forecast a little bit. So if you're in real estate and you're completely unaware that commercial and multifamily are in, in some serious trouble times and you're like unaware of that, okay, or worse, you're a passive investor and where are you getting your information from? Oh, I know the promoter that's promoting a deal. He's the one that's telling you how the great things are, right? Well, so so what I say is, Jay, I believe at least 50% of the people that have been investing in these things are aware there's an issue. And I think so people are now already looking for other things. Gotcha. Now, let's talk about note school. Let's talk about notes. So you have been literally the creative genius on architecting, uh, structuring, creative deals for decades and decades and decades. Um, I love your story as to how this started. Take us back to how all this story, uh, how all this started and how it is that you really got um, gifted at putting these deals together. But before you tell the story, let's make sure everybody understands what do we mean by a creative deal? Then tell us how all this started. Well, first of all, a note is just a promise to pay. So when you talk about private money or I talk about buying notes, it, it, they're both a note. But we're not, we're, we're not in a different business, right? Uh, and, then, and then creative notes or creative financing would be where if you don't go to the bank and get a traditional loan, you have to figure out some other creative way to structure a real estate deal. The most common that we all could relate to would be seller financing. And so that is a, that's a very common way. And you say, well, why would you, I want somebody to sell or finance me? Because they probably would carry terms softer than what a lender would in today's market conditions. Mm -hmm. All right, so Jay, how it started. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a riddle and this is going to be the theme of this conversation. It is better to do the average thing in perfect timing than the perfect thing in bad timing. I like it. So timing is everything. So I started, um, in, uh, the note business in 1980. Now, I would love to tell you that I was this young, aspiring 
real estate investor and I was just up all night watching info marketing, info TV, and I learned about this. But the truth of the matter is I was a cowboy living in a 10 by 40 mobile home. <laughs> That's the truth. And uh, I started dating this pretty blonde headed gal, which you now know, Jay, and uh, I've been married to her for 41 years at this wow. point. But her dad was a really smart, innovative guy. You've heard a lot of stories about him, Jay. He really was. He was a fireman, by the way. He was a retired assistant fire chief. But he was real estate, the typical millionaire next door, did real estate on the side, all that kind of stuff. And he, uh, but this was in 1980 and interest rates were 18%. And so if you weren't innovative, you couldn't make things work. And so they introduced me to this idea in 1980. Terrible ec economic times, right? Terrible. But yet in economic times, I stumbled straight into the slickest thing you could go chase, which was notes. Mm -hmm. So I did, I would, I'd say I just fell into it. It was not some genius thing that I knew all, I had the vision of everything. I didn't, I wouldn't say all that. You're saying, how did I learn to structure deals? I learned to structure deals in bad times. Mm -hmm. Because every innovative thing that we ever really figured out, we it was, a, it was a necessity. It was a survival mode. And then we kept them around when things got better because they worked good in that market too. So I that's a couple of things I would say to people is, because the market's changing. You know, and there's a lot, you know, there's less properties being bought. The realtors are selling less houses. The lenders are making a lot less loans, not just on commercial, but also res uh, residential. So there's a lot of things that people look at and say, well, it's just not the time to do it. And the answer is when you do things like what we do, this is the time to do it. <clears throat> well, that's what I want to drill down on. Um, and, you know, you have lived through and worked through how many cycles now since 1980? Six. Six cycles, right? Yeah. So you got a pretty good understanding as to what these different cycles look like. And with each cycle, each cycle brings its own challenge and each cycle brings its own opportunities, which are, you know, which side of the fence do you want to be on? You want to be, you know, challenged or you want to take advantage of the opportunities? Why is right now, and when I say right now, I'm talking we're here in 2023. Why is it here in 2023 that it's one of the best times to be investing in notes uh, at your note school? You have a program to where it's pretty much on a silver platter. People that are looking for alternative investments and ways that they can get a good return, you pretty much are just like flat out doing it for them. Why is why is now just a great time for that? Inventory. Inventory, and inventory changes anything. So a couple of years ago, when the when the market was uh, booming and, and giveaway interest, so to speak, there wasn't a ton of notes available and you couldn't buy those notes at good prices. In other words, you couldn't buy them at a good return on your investment. Mm -hmm. Today. If we were at a two and buying notes two years ago, we're at a 6.5 headed for an eight today. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of inventory of notes. We have more loans under due diligence in our shop at the moment than I've had in probably eight years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so inventory changes the game. And as I said to you earlier, a lot of our students raise private capital to go do deals, just mm -hmm. like your students do private capital. So we may be, you're, you may be using it to buy a house and I may be using it to buy a note, but it's the, the game is, is, is very similar. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the people that I find that are private investors that fund our deals or our students' deals have had rentals and now they're not cash flowing as well as they thought. Mm -hmm. So they're frustrated landlord. Frustrated landlords. So when you say it's an invent, it's an issue of inventory, just to make sure our listeners understand, you're not talking about an inventory of houses on the market. You're talking about an inventory of notes that are yeah. available to invest in, right? Yeah. 
So let me tell you, let me tell you right now, you know, every banker has their head on a swivel. It has been said, and these are by significant major news sources, okay? But in the last two months, it has been said by by at least a dozen major news sources, we have 4,800 FDI insured banks in the United States. We are we're headed to a market gonna, that is going to have half that many, meaning that the other banks are going to they're going to become insolvent. And when they become insolvent, they're going to get swallowed up. Now, people say, oh, yeah, I know the big banks are going to swallow them up. Well, it's better than the alternative. Mm-hmm. Whether you like that idea or you don't like it. Mm-hmm. So why, what's, hap- what's happened to the banks? The banks have issues on their balance sheet. The banks have problems on their balance sheets. One of them are commercial real estate loans, for sure. You know, one of them are other, other, other commercial loans. And so those banks are, are forced to go sell loans at a discount that otherwise they wouldn't have sold. And they're requiring their clients to do the same thing. So the inventory of seller finance notes is exponentially higher than it was two years ago for that reason. So some of the loans we buy come directly from banks. They're loans that probably got delinquent during the virus. And now they're paying again. Those are called re-performing loans. Mm -hmm. Or there are loans that, that got delinquent during the virus and they're not paying again. And those are called non-performing notes. Jay, there is 1,920,000. According to Blackstone, Mm -hmm. there there, there are 1,920,000 residential mortgages that are delinquent today. Wow. The loans that are 120 days plus delinquent, you know, they categorize loans in the level of delinquency buckets. Ones that are 120 plus, according to our mutual friend, Darren Bloomquist at auction.com, Yep. They're 600 plus days delinquent. So the delinquency, it's not, I mean, like those loans are headed for the foreclosure bucket. I mean, that's, they're, they're not going to fix. You don't bring a loan current when you're 600 days delinquent, Jay. No, that's, um, you might as well say about two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so understand that, but those are, those are, those are, inventory specific questions as to why the inventory has changed so much. And so, you know, Jay, you could, you, you, you might say that we make money when others are in distress. I'm not causing anybody stress. Like I'm not, I didn't go push over anybody's, you know, apple cart, you know, but, but when that happens and you, and then all of a sudden you start realizing there's kind of a general statement. Notes are good when banking is bad. That is kind of a general statement, but it is always proven to be true. So we, we've we seen it when banks were really good and we were having to do alternative things. And now that, you know, we're kind of in the market cycle we're in, we're, we feel like we got a pretty good runway ahead of us. When someone is has not invested in notes, they haven't invested in notes, but they are now curious about it, and they want to start getting involved and learning about note investing, what would be your advice as to what are the red flags? When someone's looking to go invest in a note, what should they be careful about? Well, there's six characteristics that probably influence the viability of a note investment. It probably also prices the note, but it's the guy that owes the money. You know, is he paying? Will he continue to pay? It's the property, you know, the collateral itself. It's, you know, the buyer's story of when they bought the property. How much did they pay down and how long have they been paying? It's the terms of the note itself, which is the interest rate on the note and how long it's payable. It's the pay history on the note, right? Meaning if they've been paying for two years before you buy it, what's that pay history look like? And then the last thing is is the paperwork. And those six characteristics over a long period of time, if you run that formula over the top of deals, 
then then it'll make a deal shine that is good or it'll hopefully make it shine that it's not good. Well, now here's my guess, Eddie. My guess is we have quite a few listeners to this show that are interested in notes, want to learn about notes, probably want to get involved in notes, but they really don't have the interest in dissecting all six of those characteristics. Yeah. Do you have a solution for them people and what do they do? Well, I, I do. We we have it. We we formed a school around 2000. And I'd been in the business 20 years by then, but we formed a school because we wanted to go do business with people and we wanted to give them a level of com- comfort, knowledge, information. And from there they could do it. And so we've got a we've got a really good little master class. I actually got teach this Jay with a friend of yours. Yes. Mr. Max. Mhm. And so we've got a master class and we show people things that they would never have thought about. You know, we show them like, what's a good note? and What's it look like? And then all of a sudden the little, the little bells start going off in their head. Cause I'd say, Hey Jay, would you buy that note? And you'd be like, Oh yes, sir. I'd buy that note. But then all of a sudden somebody goes, well, I'd run out of money. So then we show them not only how to buy notes and be the bank, but we show them leveraging techniques where they can go in there and use some, use exactly what you're a master at, which is some passive investor, passive, you know, uh, funding source. And then, and then do that so that they can then go take a small amount of money. Jay, I, with a thousand percent integrity, I can tell somebody, Jay, I can show you how to keep a thousand dollars invested. And after about 10 years, you get $1,000 a month for 10 more years for a $1,000 investment. Now, I'm not making that up, am I? No, you're not. I've, I've heard you explain how you do it. <laughs> so understand, then, it, then, then it, it's just exactly what all of us learn when we, when we kind of jump the fence and get in the training business. We're in the business of teaching people something they don't know until they know it. And then when they know it, then they're like, oh, yeah, well, I do this or I could do it this way and stuff. And so we'll 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 start down a path and just show some people some some simple, um, achievable goals. You know, the one thing you and I talked about a lot is when we put it, we put somebody in our coaching program. Now we figured out that what they really want to start with probably is for us to help them a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. Eddie, Mm -hmm. you go find me a note. Eddie, could you underwrite a note? Eddie, could you, you know, could you do all of these things? Because all of that gives them what people really want the most, which is a compression of time. Correct. Correct. So how do people and my listeners here find out about Note School? I know you got the website. Uh, Is the website the best place to to find out? What I want them to do, Jay, is I built a link for a two-hour master class. And I want to know that these are your people because you mean a lot to me. I'm telling you, you mean a lot to me. Well, same to you, Eddie. And uh, so I want them to go to noteschool.com forward slash J. J A Y. J A Y. And it's up, it's on the screen. They can see it. And when they do that, then I then we're gonna put them through a pretty solid two-hour thing. You've seen this, Jay. You know what we're talking about. It's pretty dang informative in a two-hour period. And then people can realize, hey, I like this. Most people do really like it. You know, I, I, but, but if they don't like it, it's fine. They invested two hours to figure out something they didn't want to do. That's right. And and so uh, so then that's a good way for us to do it. And we'll show them what a note looks like. We're not going to try to make you an underwriter in two hours. We're going to do it in a very simplistic method of just kind of like, hey, here's a deal. We show you how it looks. You'll show you how much income you get and when you get the income and so forth. And then all of a sudden you say, would you would you do that deal? And then all of a sudden, OK, if I do it and it's like, OK, somebody say I do it, but maybe I want some leverage. The last thing I would say to you is, Jay, here's what I've learned instinctively. Mm-hmm. Most people want to grow wealth and build legacy. That is instinctively built inside of people. And I believe that this class will give them a clear 
vision of how that's possible with notes. Absolutely. So go to www.noteschool, noteschool.com forward slash J-A-Y. That's all spelled out. Note school, N-O-T-E school, S-C-H-O-O-L.com forward slash J-A-Y. And I'll tell you, when you go there, you're about to be impressed. At this point in time, there's probably a lot that you don't know that you really do want and need to know. And Eddie and Max will unpack it for you. Eddie, thank you so much for coming on Raising Private Money with me, my friend. You are awesome, Jay. I just uh, so much enjoy hanging out with you. You and I are going to get to be at a couple of events here pretty soon. Yep. And uh, I look forward to that and uh, just a great thrill to be with your audience. Thank you so much, Eddie. Well, there you have it, my friend. Another amazing episode right here on Raising Private Money. My special guest, Eddie Speed. Dear friend, fellow mastermind member, get right on over to noteschool.com forward slash J-A-Y. And if you found this episode inspiring and you learned some good stuff, do me a favor. Be sure if you are listening on Spotify or iTunes, be sure and follow. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, share, subscribe, click that bell so you don't miss out on the next amazing episode. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business to the next level, and we'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.